Okay, so we're looking at Colossians, and we said the purpose of the epistle is to refute and warn the believers against false teaching that was threatening the church by emphasizing the supremacy of Christ. You remember what this false teaching is often called by scholars? The Colossian heresy, right. So let's try to identify the Colossian heresy. Well, of course, it's stated right there on your handout. But you didn't look, right? You just knew the answer to that question. Okay, Colossian heresy. Um, Paul doesn't come right out and define it for us. He doesn't come right out and tell us exactly what the false teachers uh, were saying. So we sort of have to piece it together from his arguments against it and his positive arguments. This is sometimes called mirror reading. You're trying to figure out what was going on, what he was responding to. So as you read Colossians, and uh, um, you need to have read it for today, of course, so hopefully you've read it recently, but if not, just remember from your reading of it, what are some things that might make up this so-called Colossian heresy? Are there any, any things that come to mind that he addresses that might give us some insight as to what this false teaching was? There does seem to be a wrong view of Christ from all that he says about the Lord Jesus and the exalting of Christ and showing the supremacy of Christ. There there perhaps was a wrong view of Christ. Let's look at a couple of these examples. For example, chapter 1, I want you to look at this with me, Colossians 1, because Verses 15 through 19 are perhaps um, some of the most exalted verses on the supremacy of Christ. Some of the most exalted Christology we have in the New Testament. So this would be a really good passage to memorize so that you can meditate on the person of Christ. Notice Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Um, One interpretive issue, at least, and your reading touched on this, is the use of the word in verse 15, firstborn. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? Does that mean uh, that uh, we should have sort of a Jehovah's Witness view of Christ, that he is a created being? He is the firstborn? What do we do with that term? John? Okay, firstborn can refer to temporal preeminence like the, the, the eldest child. It can have that meaning in Scripture. It can also have this idea of preeminence of rank. So a person of a, of a very high rank, like a king, for example. Let me give you one cross-reference, Psalm 89 Verse 27 says, speaking of of, uh, the king, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Okay, so there it's clearly not referring to firstborn in terms of Temporal preeminence, the firstborn child. 
it's talking about the highest rank. And that's how Paul uses this term here. Because verse 16 says that for by him all things were created. And then he goes on to list all realms. So in heaven and on earth. Well, you think of Christ as a, you know, in the Godhead, a heavenly being. If he created all things even in heaven, then obviously he himself was not created. He is the source of creation. All things are created, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers, authorities. It's very comprehensive. So verse 16 helps us define what firstborn means in verse 15. Notice also at the end of verse 16, all things were created through him. So he is the agent of creation. But notice all things are created for him which again highlights his supremacy. All things are created for his glory, which includes you and me. We're created for the glory of Christ. So we don't, when we live independently, we live in rebellion against the purpose for which we were created. We were created for Christ. And so, as Augustine said, we'll, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And we begin to fulfill the purpose for which we were created. We were created for Him. Um, also, chapter 2, I've given you some references. We won't look at all of them, but um, notice the end of verse 2. He's talking about Christ, and he says, In whom are hidden, verse, chapter 2, verse 3, In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so... One application of that in chapter 2, he talks about don't be deceived by philosophy, human philosophy. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Because in Christ, philosophy is the love of wisdom, theoretically. Love of knowledge. Well, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You don't have to look for something else. Verses 6 through 10. Exhortation practically. You receive Christ the Lord. Walk in Him. Um, Verse 9. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That's a very compact statement of orthodox Christology. Fully God and yet fully human. Fullness of deity dwells in him bodily. And you have, verse 10, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So, very, very high view of Christ, which might suggest that they were the false teachers, this Colossian heresy part of it, would be um, saying maybe that, oh yeah, Christ is okay, but... But he's sort of just a beginning. You need to go on from Christ and, and get into this, these philosophies that we're teaching. And, and uh, you need to follow our practices. Christ isn't an okay starting point. And Paul's saying, no way. Christ is supreme. He is preeminent over all. You don't need to go on from him to something else. He is all in all. Okay. Anything else you might identify as part of this Colossian heresy? Wrong view of Christ? Anything else? Any verses might suggest what they were teaching? Okay, well, it looks like there are some Hellenistic elements. What do we mean by Hellenistic elements? Go. Greek, right. A um, couple of examples. Chapter 2, verse 3, the verse we just looked at, emphasizing wisdom and knowledge. Remember, that's that was the Greeks were all about that. And so, verse 8, we also looked at this. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. The Greeks were big time into philosophy. Um, there's also this reference in verse 8, and... My, depends on your translation. My translation, ESV, says the last phrase, according to the elemental spirits of the world. 
and not according to Christ. Yours might say something like the elementary principles or the principles of the world. The word um, elemental or elementary is a word that would often refer to the spirit world. And so there might have been an unhealthy focus on the spirit world. And therefore, Paul brings out, for example, in chapter 2, verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Christ has defeated these spirits. There's also a reference in chapter 2, 18 to the worship of angels. So there was, part of in, as part of this Colossian her- heresy, a, a fixation on the spirit world, not unlike in Ephesians. But there also seems to be, so we can pick out some of these Greek influence, there also seems to be a Jewish or some Jewish elements as well. A couple of examples. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Remember, the Judaizers wanted to add circumcision. And so Paul says, in Christ you have essentially a circumcision of the heart. Um, There's also a reference to the law being done away with in Christ. 2.14, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. It's probably a reference to the Mosaic Law. And then notice 2.16. Clearly this is a Jewish um, element. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Okay, so wrong view of Christ, some Hellenistic elements, some Jewish elements, all kind of blended together. The result is what people often call syncretism. Syncretism is sort of a blending of different religious ideas to form kind of a new religion. You take traditions, religious traditions from various sources and sort of blend them together. Okay, so that seems to be, from what we can put together from the epistle itself, that seems to be the false teaching in view. We wish we could define it more precisely, but um, it seems to be made up of these three elements. Now, Over the page, page three, applying Colossians. I want to spend just a few times or a few uh, points on some practical lessons that we can draw from from Colossians. And let me recommend a book. Sam Storm's The Hope of Glory. This is... um, I don't usually recommend devotional books because a lot of times it's kind of fluff. It's very, very milky instead of meaty, right? Well, here's an example of a devotional that's very meaty. It goes through Colossians um, uh, fairly slowly, so it'll it'll have uh, several meditations even on one verse, and it'll it'll help you think through the text. Think through the theology of the text, but also the practical application as well. It's a very, very good book. Do we have any in the bookstore, Ryan? But Ryan could order it for you. So something to ask for for your birthday or something like that. Okay. In Colossians, we see a strong emphasis, as we've just talked about, on the preeminence and supremacy of Christ. We want to be people who are occupied with Christ and His supremacy. We want to meditate on the glories of Christ. That's what's going to, according to 2 Corinthians, that's how we're transformed into His likeness, by beholding the glory of Christ. 
of the Lord in the face of Jesus Christ. So this is a good book in which to meditate on the glories of Christ and see Him and His excellencies and hopefully to be transformed. But there's, there's another um, lesson that we can learn from the preeminence and supremacy of Christ. And, and I've put, the, um, put that on your handout. Warren Wiersbe says this on the relevance of Colossians for today. He says, the church today desperately needs the message of Colossians. We live in a day when religious toleration is interpreted to mean one religion is just as good as another. Some people try to take the best from various religious systems and manufacture their own private religion. To many people, Jesus Christ is only one of several great religious teachers with no more authority than they. He may be prominent, but he is definitely not preeminent. This is an age of syncretism. There's that word again. People are trying to harmonize and unite many different schools of thought and come up with a superior religion. Our evangelical churches are in danger of diluting the faith in their loving attempt to understand the beliefs of others. Mysticism, legalism, Eastern religions, asceticism, and man-made philosophies are secretly creeping into churches. They are not denying Christ, but they are dethroning Him and robbing Him of His rightful place of preeminence. I think that's a very perceptive statement as to what is even going on in evangelical churches. We don't want to offend anyone, and so we're not going to say your religion is is wrong. We're not going to emphasize Christ as the only way. As Scripture does, Scripture shows us that Christ is the only way, and it's not an arrogant kind of thing. That's the myth of of our postmodern culture, to say that, that if you make a truth claim, you're being arrogant. It's not arrogant. It's, it's, it's being loving to help people see the truth. And so don't, don't give in to this syncretism, this political correctness where, you, where you're afraid to be bold for Christ and, and assert that He is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, we need to be bold. And in a loving way, right? not in an obnoxious way, but in a loving way, hold out the supremacy, the preeminence of Christ. So guard against that in your own life as we get intimidated by man, by humans. Come back to Colossians and see the supremacy of Christ. Another practical lesson is learning proper priorities from Paul's prayers. And one of, one of the greatest of Paul's prayers is here in Colossians chapter, Colossians chapter 1. Um, we're not going to take the time to, to work through all of Paul's prayers um, that I've listed on your handout. But here is something that you might want to do in your own devotional life is to work through these passages listed on pages 3 and 4 and um, just list some of the things that Paul prays for. Let's, Let's look at the Colossians example, though. And as we read through this, just take some notes on the kinds of things that Paul is praying for. So look at Colossians 1, 9 through 14. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let's pause for a minute there. Um, Who planted the church at Colossae? Paul? Not Paul. Epaphras. So he's writing to believers that he has not personally met. And yet notice what he says in verse 9. From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Wow. That in itself is instructive, right? We usually just pray for our own little circle. 
Paul's praying for people he hadn't even met, and he's doing so repeatedly. And in fact, this is one of the greatest prayers in Scripture for people he didn't even know. So our prayers might be an index as to how small our, our world is. We need to be global Christians and be praying for believers and, and, and eager to learn of believers in other parts of the world, other parts of the country that we can be praying for. I think it's specifically here about the persecuted church and how, how good it would be for us to pray earnestly for them. What are the kinds of things we should pray for? Well, notice that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And the knowledge of his will here isn't some mystical thing. It's what he's revealed in scriptures, that you would be filled with that and have spiritual wisdom, being able to apply what you see in Scripture with wisdom and discernment and understanding. Verse 10, there's a purpose clause, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Studying all of this, studying Scripture like we are, is not just to gain uh enough knowledge to be able to write an orthodox statement of faith. That's important. But there is an outworking of that knowledge so that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. How often do we pray for that? Lord, help me to be filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom, spiritual wisdom and understanding so that I might walk worthy of you today. Um, Verse 10, continuing on. Fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may conquer mountains and things no strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. We need supernatural power for that, to be patient and have joy in the midst. And then, of course, part of prayer, you just, if you're God-centered, you break out into thanksgiving, and he does that. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in Light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If you don't know how to pray, and, and, and that is a dilemma. Sometimes we, we, we have good intentions and we, we say, okay, I'm going to set some time aside to pray, and we start praying and we sort of fall into the same old rut. You know, not sure what the best things to pray. Here, pray this prayer. For yourself, pray it for others. Because our prayers can also be an index of how maybe superficial and self-centered our Christianity is. We're always just praying, oh Lord, uh, you know, give me money, help me to pass this test, you know. Those are not, that really, those uh, reveal our priorities. And so, focusing on these kinds of prayers that Paul gives should help us align ourselves with what is most important. Our spiritual needs are always our greatest needs. Physical needs, yeah, we go to a prayer meeting, usually spend most of the time praying for the sick. And we should pray for sick. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But that might reveal that we think our greatest needs are physical you look at Paul's prayers, you should learn very quickly that our greatest needs are spiritual. We need, we need prayer to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to bear fruit in every good work, to increase in the knowledge of God, to be patient with joy. We need a lot of prayer in that regard. Um, why don't we just look at one more, the last one, number five, Philippians 1, 9 through 11. I commend all of them to you for your meditation, but let's just look at Philippians 
1, 9 through 11. Here's, here's another good pray, prayer to, to pray for yourself and for others. And it's not a long one. It's not a long one. It's just a nice short one, but it's, it's very rich. Philippians 1, 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So not just kind of this warm, fuzzy love, but with knowledge and discernment. How often does the New Testament call us to love one another? It's probably the most frequent exhortation of the New Testament. We need to pray that our love would abound and that we would have knowledge and discernment in it, verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What a great prayer. Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. How do you grow wise? We face so many choices and decisions in, in our lives all the time. How do you become a wise, spiritually wise person while you fill yourself with the knowledge that comes from God? And that's how you gain discernment. That's how you gain the ability to approve what is excellent. And so pray for those kinds of things. And pray that you'd be pure and blameless and filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ so that you'd live a life to the glory of God, the life for which you were created to live. Remember Colossians 1? All things were created through Him and for Him. So, again, meditate on some of these prayers in your, your own devotions. Pray through these things. Make it your practice to pray through these things. I think you'll find a spiritual revival happen in your life if you do that. Let me recommend another book. D.A. Carson's book, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, Priorities from Paul and His Prayers. This book has really impacted everything I've said so far. It's really, it's really a transforming kind of book. It's, it's, I, everyone should not only have a copy of this book, but read it. Do we have it in the bookstore? We might have one copy, so get there fast and get it, and then order some more. Uh, this is a really, really, really good book on prayer, and um, I commend it to you. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to Philemon. Any questions, comments? Okay, let's let's move on to Philemon. <laughs> And uh, this is actually the shortest of Paul's letters. There's only, for those of you who really like details, 335 words in the Greek text. So this is the shortest of, of Paul's letters. Some of you taking the prison epistles course? Who's taking that? Do you have to write a... Do you have to write a paper on Philemon? Is that one of the assignments? No? It used to be. Okay. Date. Well, Philemon, once again, we see very clearly Paul refers to himself as a prisoner. He, he uh, makes that very clear. And so we can compare Philemon with some of the other prison epistles and make some connections. So, for example, Colossians and Philemon both mention <coughs> Timothy, Epaphras, Archippus, Aristocarchus and Mark are both mentioned. Again, Mark has obviously been reconciled to Paul by this point. 
and is uh, serving with him. Luke and Demas are both mentioned. And Onesimus. Who is Onesimus? The runaway slave, right. So all, all of these people are, are mentioned in both Colossians and Philemon. So it seems, it seems fairly clear that um, they were written at the same time and, and from the same place, which we are estimating about 60 or 61 A.D. from Paul's Roman imprisonment that's described in Acts chapter... Someone say it. 28, yes. Okay, so we have this, this shortest of Paul's epistle, Philemon. Um, you might think about, okay, what's going on here? And what's the value of Philemon? This is a short little book. Well, what's the situation that Paul addresses in Philemon? Yeah, how you deal with this runaway slave. Basically, you have, we learned from Colossians 4, 9 that Onesimus was from Colossae, and so Philemon is from Colossae too. Onesimus was Philemon's slave, and he had wronged him from in some way. Verse 18 of Philemon says, if he has wronged you at all, assuming that's true, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. So maybe Onesimus uh, robbed Philemon and he ran away. He comes in contact with Paul in Rome. Phi that is, Onesimus does. And Paul led him to Christ. Verse 10, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. So Paul clearly leads Onesimus to Christ. Now what do you do? You have this dilemma. Here's this, this guy who has wronged his master. Yet now he's become a Christian. Okay, so basically the whole purpose of Philemon then is to urge Philemon to forgive Onesimus and receive him back as a brother in Christ. That's the purpose of the book. Now, there's obviously been some things that have been going on previously. Paul has no doubt said, look, Onesimus, you've got to make this right. You've got you've to go back to Philemon. And so Paul's now writing to Philemon and urging him to receive Onesimus, Onesimus back, to forgive him. Okay, so great, interesting story, but why, why, in the, why would this book be in the canon of Scripture? What is the value of Philemon? That's that's an interesting question. What does it contribute? Any suggestions? What does Philemon contribute? Why would it be included in the canon of Scripture? We, if we lost Philemon. What would we be missing? It is very much doctrine lived out and illustrated in a practical way. So how do you live out Christianity when you face these kind of dilemmas? Okay, good. Very good. Anything else? Ryan? Yeah, that whole issue of... of Slavery and Christianity, it's, Philemon contributes quite a bit to that. Um, let me give you a couple of points. I think, I think it provides a model for Christian relationships. Think about it. Um, how are we to relate to one another in the body of Christ with all of our diversity? So you have, for example, Paul with... Philemon. Paul has the authority just to command Philemon what to do. He's an apostle, but that's, he doesn't do that. He appeals to him. 
He appeals to his Christian conscience to do the right thing. Uh, think of think of Philemon with Onesimus. Onesimus had wronged Philemon, and yet Philemon is urged to forgive him. Philemon was in a position over Onesimus. He was the master. Onesimus was a slave. And yet, Paul exhorts him to receive him how? As a what? As a brother. Wow, that that's a radical concept. Master and slave equal? Equality? Brothers? That was a radical idea. So in terms of, of Christian relationships and how we relate to one another in the body of Christ, I think Philemon is, is helpful. And obviously Onesimus, there's a lesson too. You do something wrong, you need to ask forgiveness. You need to seek to make restitution. You've wronged another person. You don't just run away and deal with the problem. But also this issue of... Uh, Slavery. So we get some kind of window into a Christian approach to social issues. And this is very interesting uh, how Paul deals with this. Um, some people will criticize the New Testament because it doesn't directly attack the institution of slavery. And usually when they're thinking of slavery, they're thinking of uh, American slavery um, and what that was like. And, but slavery, first century slavery in the Greco-Roman world was different. But that doesn't mean that it was you know, a good thing. Okay? Nevertheless, how do you deal with this social issue like slavery? Well, the New Testament doesn't directly condemn it. So does that mean somehow the New Testament is uh, short-sighted or something like that. Actually, people who make that kind of criticism miss what Paul is doing here in Philemon. What Paul is doing is more powerful than just directly attacking uh, the institution of slavery. Notice I've given you a few uh, quotations on this on your handout, page 5. Hendrik. Hendrikus Burkhoff says this, Paul put Philemon in an impossible position in respect to his slave. The master-slave relationship is not abolished from without, that is some external command, but it's undermined from within. N imagine how the, the nature of slavery would change if the master thought of the slave as a brother, as an equal. F.F. F. Bruce says this. What this letter does is to bring us into an atmosphere in which the institution of slavery could only wilt and die. So more powerful than just some command. And then one more statement from Donald Guthrie. He says of Philemon 16, let me read that. This is the exhortation to Philemon to receive Onesimus, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So Guthrie says, in one significant phrase, that is, a beloved brother, Paul transforms the character of the master-slave relationship. Onesimus is returning no longer as a slave, but as a dear brother. Okay, so this is actually a powerful little book that uh, has a lot to say how we deal with social issues of our day. It's not, not just by some fiat, some command, but transform it from within. Okay. Um, we want to do one more thing today, and it's you don't have a handout for it, so if you want to use the back of uh, today's handout or another piece of paper, you can. What we want to look at very briefly is something called the new perspective on Paul. 
And I just want to give you a brief introduction to this. I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail because this is a very technical kind of thing. This is something that uh, usually is dealt with by scholars at a very technical level. And, and so I don't want to confuse you with all of that. However, there is a trickle-down effect of how some churches can think now about the gospel because what the new perspective essentially does is it rejects the traditional traditional evangelical doctrine of justification. Justification by faith alone. Now you remember... We talked about justification uh, in Romans. And it's, it's certainly for Paul, it's one of his central ways of explaining what happens in the gospel, at least in Romans and Galatians. It's, justification is very prominent. You remember what we said justification means, essentially? What does justification mean? To declare righteous. It's a forensic term. You remember? Legal term. And it's on the basis of the work of Christ. And there's actually two sides to the coin. We're declared righteous, but there's also where we receive the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to our account. And so we are declared righteous. What the new perspective does is to reject that traditional understanding and, and in fact argue that that understanding of justification, what I've just said, comes from the Reformation. It comes from Martin Luther. It doesn't come from Paul. And so it claims that the traditional understanding of justification is a misreading of Paul. It's reading Luther back into Paul. And so what we have to do, these new perspective people say, what we need to do is go back to the first century, go back to first century Judaism, and understand what was going on in that context. Now, let me just say, so far so good. I mean... I mean, that principle is a good one, that you, you, you be careful not to read a later theological debate back into the New Testament. You need to go back to the original context and understand Paul in his own day, not in the context of Luther. Okay, so in principle, that's, a, that's good, and that's one positive contribution of the new perspective. However, I think they ultimately misread, uh, and not me, but many evangelical scholars think they misread the Judaism of Paul's day. We'll come back to that. But basically, they think that what, what's going on is Luther, Luther had this very sensitive conscience regarding sin, and what he was combating was the indulgent system of the medieval church, the the legalism of the medieval church. Works were a way to earn your salvation, so you buy this indulgence, or, or you do these good works, you do penance, you do these kind of things, and, and you earn your salvation. Okay, And so Luther objected to that, he fought against that, and he declared, Paul says that we're justified by faith alone, not by works. And so evangelicals then have saw the Judaism, or at least the Judaizers that Paul was uh, opposing, as a similar kind of thing, that they were basically trying to earn their salvation through works. And Paul then rejects that. Now, the new perspective understanding of, of Paul which, by the way, if you're interested, came through a scholar by the name of E.P. Sanders back in the 1970s, and it grew from there. But basically what Sanders and, and others who followed him said was that the Judaism of Paul's day was not like Luther's context. The Judaism of Paul's day, they were not trying to earn salvation by works. That's not what was going on. 
That's not what Paul was opposing, salvation by works. Sanders and others claim that the Jews of Paul's days, Paul's day and Jesus' day, were boasting in the fact that they were God's chosen people. So they believed they were already saved. They were, they were the elect. They were the Jews. And so their works were not done to earn salvation. They already had salvation. They were the chosen people. Their works were done to show that they were God's people. So the problem, according to the new perspective, is that the Judaism of Paul's day was not legalistic. That is, you try to earn salvation through doing works. The problem was it was ethnocentric. Meaning, you know, celebrating our Jewishness and, and that earns our salvation. And we do these works like circumcision and the law and stuff to, to show we're God's people. So s some have used the phrase, the works of the law are boundary markers to show that you're in the covenant. Works, another sort of phrase, buzz phrase connected with the new perspective is that the works of the law are not about getting in, but staying in. So you do the law to maintain your status as God's chosen people. So when Paul comes along with his message... He's not as concerned about soteriology, that is, how you get saved. Paul's more concerned about ecclesiology, that is, Jews accepting Gentiles in the one body of, of the church. Okay, now, with any error, there's usually elements of truth. Okay, and so... The new perspective has some things that are that are true in that, yes, Paul is concerned about ecclesiology, about Jew and Gentile relationships. We've seen lots of examples of that. But they go wrong by misunderstanding that Paul's view of justification is about soteriology. Um, and let me try to unpack that a little bit for you. The, the new perspective, as I said, is pretty technical, and there's different schools of it. But one, there's at least one author that has brought it down to a more popular level that is not so technical, and that is a guy by the name of N.T. Wright. Um, let me just highlight some three points from Wright that should disturb you. They are, they are disturbing. Some alarming marks of the new perspective. Wright claims that the gospel is not about how to get saved. The gospel is not about how to get saved. Well, you might say, okay, well, what is the gospel if it's not about how to get saved? According to Wright, the, the gospel, which gospel means what? Good news. So the gospel is really the announcement that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is Lord. He's risen from the dead. That's good news. Jesus is Messiah and he's risen. So you, we shouldn't think about the gospel as how to get saved. It's just an announcement of the lordship of Christ or the, the messiahship of Christ. Uh, is that right? Okay, certainly the gospel includes that. But the gospel is about getting saved. 
Let me let me show you just a couple of texts. First Corinthians. Where would you go to define the gospel? <laughs> First Corinthians. Somewhere. Where? First Corinthians. Fifteen. Good. Actually, let's start in First Corinthians fifteen one and two. Notice, follow this, the text closely. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. And then 3 and 4, For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according, in accordance with the Scriptures. But notice in chapter or verse 2 the connection with salvation. He's, he says, okay, I'm going to remind you of the Gospel. And it's this gospel by which you are saved. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. And of course, in verse 3, it talks about Christ died for our sins. So that very statement itself has to connect with soteriology. Christ died for our sins. One other text, 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 10. Now here's the tricky thing, 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 10. Some of these scholars would say to us, well, you know, Paul didn't write 2 Timothy. That's not a Pauline epistle. And so that's, that's one reason why we need to spend a little bit of time with each book on authorship because people can just dismiss Pauline authorship and then not include this as a Pauline book. But we'll see that there are very, 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 very good reasons to accept 2 Timothy as being written under inspiration by the Apostle Paul. But notice what he says, chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us. Notice the connection with the gospel in the very next verse. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. So there's a connection with Paul rejecting works in connection with salvation. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What is salvation but new life? And so Paul says, we've received life and immortality, eternal life, through the gospel. That's how you get it. So I think Wright is profoundly mistaken by claiming the gospel is not about how to get saved. Another thing he claims is justification is not how you become a Christian. So similar to number one, but specifically now talking about justification. Let me give you a quote from Wright. He says, Justification is not how someone becomes a Christian. It is a declaration that they have become a Christian. It is a declaration that they have become a Christian. Right should change his name to wrong. Well, no. I'm, I'm sorry, that was uncharitable. Uh, it seems that Wright is saying a person is, is saved by, by a combination of faith and works. 
And so justification reveals that to be true, that you're, you're saved. Well, how would we refute that? Let me give you one text. Many we could look at, but one text. Romans 5, 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Paul has been explaining in chapter 4, you remember, justification by faith alone. And, and the example is Abraham. He's not saved by works. He's saved by faith. So chapter 4 in itself, I think, goes against the new perspective. And, and certainly right. But then Paul summarizes verse five, er, chapter 5, verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the connection there is that justification is being presented by Paul as, as resulting or bringing the result of a new relationship with God. We have peace with God because we have been justified by faith. Okay, so certainly justification by faith is how you become a Christian. Now, it's not the only way that Paul and other New Testament authors can talk about salvation, but it's, it is one way to look at it okay so one other point that flows out of number two is justification does not have to do with the gospel when when paul talks about justification he's not thinking about how a person comes into a right relationship with god again it's this justification is an after the fact kind of thing Let me give you one text, um, and this is actually Paul preaching in Acts. This is Acts 13, 38 and 39. Acts 13, 38 and 39. He says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Verse 39. And by him everyone who believes is your translation probably has freed as mine does, but that word in the original Greek is actually justified. By him, everyone who believes is justified from everything from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So, clear connection with forgiveness of sins, justified, freed from everything from the law. Now, I want to give you just, uh, I could give you so many passages in Romans, for example, that refute the new perspective. But let me g just give you three other passages that I think clearly refute the new perspective and their reading of Paul and their reading of what Paul was opposing in Judaism. Okay? First one is Titus 3.5. Anyone remember that from Awana? Titus 3.5. Not by... Not by works. Now, the ESV has, He saved us. So there's the idea of salvation. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So clearly salvation, not by works. Justification does lead to salvation, eternal life. That's a very strong text. And by the way, Titus is a good, great book, as we'll see, to understand the relationship between justifi justification and works. Paul's, Paul emphasizes justification by faith alone. That's how we're saved. But after you're saved, you are supposed to, because you're saved, you have a new nature, you're supposed to engage in good works. Paul emphasizes that in Titus. The, the other passage is one we already looked at in 2 Timothy chapter 1. I just want to read it one more time, verse 9. 2 Timothy 1, 9. 
who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works. That was a problem in the first century. You tried to earn your way through works. It, the reason it's a problem in the first century and the reason it's a problem in the 16th century with Luther is because it is a perennial problem. That is, it's, a, it's always a problem of the flesh. We try to earn our way. We try to earn our way and win our way to salvation. That's how we're wired. We want to do it ourselves. We're independent. We don't want to have to boast in God. We want to boast in ourselves. And so when Paul's explaining justification by faith in Romans 3 and Romans 4, he says, where then is boasting? It's excluded because you're not earning it yourself. You're relying on God's grace. Okay, one more passage. This is another one you all know from Sunday School, Awana. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Let's say it together. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so not as a result of works. Okay, now I'm going to say something a little bit technical, but try and follow. Let's say, this is hard to say. Let's say, oh, it's hard to say. Let's say you don't accept Pauline authorship for these books. This is very hypothetical now, okay? And say, okay, well, Paul didn't write those. The, the question still remains, well, Everyone, even these scholars who reject Pauline authorship, recognize that these books were written by someone in the Pauline school. Okay, some followers of Paul or something. And this is still the first century, virtually everyone would say. Some push the pastorals a little later, but still very, very early, still in the context of Judaism of the day. How can they say so clearly how can they refute so clearly the idea of work salvation if that's not what they thought in the first century? These books bring it out very, very clearly. So even if you reject, reject Pauline authorship, which we don't, you still have a major problem with these texts because they're promoting or they're refuting the concept of works salvation. You follow that? Does that make sense? Nod just to humor me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, you may come across this new perspective. It, it, it is trickling down sometimes into places like the Emergent Church and other sources. Um, know that most, uh, a lot of scholarly work has been done by um, some very reputable scholars, and they're they all see major, major problems with this new perspective on Paul.